Street Fighter 6 is on the way and I cannot contain my excitement. The whole aesthetic is dope as hell. Every single character trailer has blown me away, even for the characters I know I'm not gonna use, like Guile. No offense to Guile, I just can't do that charging shit. And this new world tour mode is looking to be one of the best features ever added to the franchise. You mean I can walk around and throw hands in the Street Fighter world? Say less! So all this hype got me thinking. I already did a full explanation of the Mortal Kombat lore. Why not take a crack at this one? So to Dan on his gaming history, we're explaining the full timeline of the Street Fighter lore. And I'm not talking about a simple summary here. We're going over everybody in the roster. Then from there, we'll make some assumptions about the Street Fighter 6 story based on what we know. Let's get into it. We begin in the year 1987, with the first Street Fighter game developed by Takashi Nishiyama and Hiroshi Matsumoto. Nishiyama was inspired to make the game after working on IRM's title Kung Fu Master, or Spartan X in Japan. After the game's release, Capcom yoinked him from IRM, and there he improved on what he created with Spartan X. In an interview with 1UP.com, he states that he wanted to create a game with more depth. Back then, games were simple. You run around and shoot shit. That's it. He wants to create an actual story with characters who had goals. Crazy how that was a goal when the Street Fighter lore now is all over the place. As for the story, the first game focuses on Ryu, an orphan martial artist learned how to throw hands from Master Goken. To test his training, my man flies to Thailand and enters the first World Warrior Tournament. He adokens his way through the competition until he gets to the champ, Sagat, the Emperor of Muay Thai. And this dude beats the brakes off of Ryu. It gets so bad that he tries to show mercy while our boy is down, but he immediately realizes that was a mistake when Ryu gives him the meanest wake-up show you can of his life, leaving a legendary scar on his chest. With that, Ryu takes the win, but he walks away feeling off. Something took over when he showed you Ken Sagat. He'll soon find out that it was Asatsui no Hado, the surge of murderous intent. AKA Black Air Force Energy. Now, though they weren't important to the plot, the first Street Fighter also debuted Ryu's best friend and rival, Ken, the assassin, Gen, Sagat's pupil, Adon, the English bouncer, Eagle, and the British fighter, Birdie. There are others, but they're just one-off characters who never show up again, so we'll skip them. Now onto the Alpha series, which yes, came out after Street Fighter 2, but canonically takes place right after Street Fighter. Let's get into it. When it comes to the story, a lot of things are going on at the same time. For Ryu, after his fight with Sagat, he returned home only to find his master Goken dead, killed by the man's own brother, Akuma, the master of the Satsui no Hado, AKA the Lord of Black Air Force Energy. So he goes looking for the murderer while getting some much needed training done. While this is going on, Sagat also trains his ass off for his rematch against Ryu and develops a tiger blow in the process. So to get better than Ryu, you just bit off his move? That's sad, Sagat. Later, he's found by his old student, Adon, who's now looking to challenge him for the title of Emperor of Muay Thai. Men saw his master get beat and was like, hold up, let me try. And he actually wins. Damn, I didn't even realize how many else the got took. Elsewhere, Rolento from the Final Fight series makes his debut. We won't get too much into the Final Fight plot, but know that it is connected to the Street Fighter story. If you want a Final Fight lore summary, let me know in the comments. Rolento used to be a part of the Mad Gear gang, but he dipped and left Metro City because the gang life was starting to suck. Now he's out to achieve his dream to form a utopia. Sodom, also from Final Fight in the Mad Gear gang, finds him to try and bring him back, but Rolento refuses. Meanwhile, the crime boss M. Bison starts plying. M. Bison is the leader of the dark organization known as Shadaloo, and a master of using the malevolent energy dubbed Psycho Power. But since it's evil, it's a double-edged sword. Psycho Power is strong as shit, but it's tearing his body apart. Eventually, he'll need a new one. He hears about Ryu's achievements and sets out to find him. On the way, he recruits Sagat, since the guy has a huge hate boner for Ryu, and Birdie from the first Street Fighter. Also, one quick thing. I'm sure you're all wondering how Birdie went from being practically white in Street Fighter 1 to being black in Alpha. Well, according to his Alpha 3 winning quote, it's because he was sick. So homie was not only a whole different skin color, but looked completely different because he was feeling under the weather. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but this is Street Fighter. Anyway, back to Bison's antics. His former student, Roche, has to thwart his plans, but he escapes her smoke by playing dead. Later, he's found by kicking master Chun Li, who's looking to avenge her father, who Bison killed. But Bison bodies her and laughs away. Then the last person to come for the bison smoke is USAF First Lieutenant Charlie Nash. He heard rumors that Shadow Lou agents were hiding in the American military, so he wants some answers from the crime boss himself. But in a sick turn of events, he's betrayed by his own people and shot in the back. Damn, Bison is steamrolling through all his obstacles right now. While that's going on, Akuma runs into Gen from the first Street Fighter. Akuma's still on his quest for a worthy opponent, but Gen is sadly suffering from leukemia. He wants a worthy opponent too to end his life, and he's hoping Akuma can be that guy. But Akuma lets him go because he wants real 
real unsick hands. The quest for smoke brings him to Ryu, who if you don't remember was looking for him all this time. Akuma tests Ryu out and confirms that he can tap into the Satsui no Hado, but he's not at the level that he wants. So he lets him go, but destroys the island they're on to show him what a fully realized Black Air Force petitioner looks like. Following this, Ryu is finally met by Sagat for their rematch, and this dude Sagat actually wins. Hey, look at you Sagat. But out of pity for the guy, and also because he's still shook by the Satsui no Hado business, Ryu let him win. Never mind Sagat, you suck. But this serves as a growth moment for Sagat. For one, he ends up training even harder and upgrades his Tiger Blow to the Tiger Uppercut we all know and love. And two, when he eventually runs into the clown ass fighter, Dan Hibiki, he doesn't completely murder his ass. See, Dan's father Go once challenged Sagat and took out one of his eyes. So Sagat killed his ass, thus fueling Dan's drive for revenge. But Dan is a garbage ass fighter. Like, you may be able to finesse them in the game, but in lore, he is ass. So when Sagat ran into him and saw this dude filled with anger, it kind of reminded him of himself and how Ryu made him feel. So he let the poor dude win. Unfortunately, this went to Dan's head and led to him making his own dojo to teach his crappy made up martial arts to others. But that's a story for another time. Back to the main plot. Over time, Bison realizes that his psycho power is becoming too much for his body to handle. There goes that double-edged sword. But he had some contingency plan set up just in case. For one, he has this newest project known as the Psycho Drive. It's a doomsday machine Shadaloo is building which is capable of channeling a shit ton of psycho energy into him. And to handle all that power, he and his scientists made a perfect clone of him named Kami. She becomes a part of his League of Assassins known as the Dolls. However, during a mission to assassinate the Indian fighter Dollseam, who's only in the story to raise money for his village, he snaps her out of her mind control. In response, Bison sends his dolls after her, as well as a member of Shadaloo named Vega. Vega is an assassin from a noble family in Spain who actually made his debut in Street Fighter 2. And fun fact, his fighting style is a combination of bullfighting and ninjutsu. That's pretty dope. But alas, he's another charge character that my simple mind cannot handle. Anyway, these guys go after Kami, but they all fail. Kami too broken, bro. So with little options left, Bison goes back to plan A, get Ryu. But he doesn't want to just show up and snatch him up. That's not what main villains do. Instead, he kidnaps his best friend Ken and controls his mind using psycho power. Man said work smarter, not harder. Pissed, Ryu confronts Ken and gives him the hands of friendship to knock him out of his mind control. Sadly, Bison pulls up and beats his ass right after though. Now our boy finally has Ryu where he wants him. He uses his psycho power to control him and hands him to his subordinate Sagat so they can have another go at their rematch. But unbeknownst to Bison, Sagat has some character development. He now understands that being fueled by hatred ain't doing shit for him. Plus, who would want to fight their rival when they're being mind controlled? That's some pussy shit. Facts. So Sagat makes an effort to snap Ryu out of his mind control. Meanwhile, Ken returns from getting them hands of friendship and is joined by Sakura to hold off Bison. This girl's a high school student who idolized Ryu ever since she saw him throw hands in the first World Warrior tournament. She's only here because she's been following Ryu to see if he'll train her. Back to the smoke, Sagat manages to free Ryu, and in the process, Ryu discovers a connection between the Satsui no Hado and Psycho Power. He then confronts Bison for their rematch, and this time wins with a strong ass Metsu Shoryuken. With that, Sagat and Ryu agree that they'll settle their true rematch later. Then they, Ken, and Sakura leave while Bison crawls back to his psycho drive to recover. But he forgot about his rogue agent, Kami. She returns to the rest of the dolls looking to defeat Bison once and for all, to free them from his psychic control. However, Bison warns that killing him will only destroy their minds. So after beating Bison, Kami uses the psycho drive to save the dolls, but they all fall unconscious from the strain while trying to escape the base. No worries though, cause Vega finds and saves them from the collapsing HQ. He believes that beings as beautiful as them shouldn't die. So, basically, Vega joined Chattaloo only to fail his first mission, then save the girls that beat his boss? Dude might as well be an anti-hero with how useless he is as a villain. Damn, I never thought about it like that, but yeah, you're right. As for Bison, well, this man doesn't believe in death. He somehow transfers his essence to the body of Rose, and that ends the story of the Alpha series. But there are still a bunch of characters he missed because they honestly didn't do much in the story. So here's a quick background on all of them. To start, we have the Russian wrestler Zangiev. Originating from Street Fighter 2, he was initially tasked by the leader of the Soviet Union to show the world their country's strength. However, after the Psycho Drive's reveal, his mission was changed to apprehend Shadaloo. Next, we have Guy, the ninja from Final Fight who studies the Bushin Ryu style. He also pulled out after hearing about Shadaloo from his master, Zeku. We'll learn more about Zeku once we get to Street Fighter 5. Also from Final Fight, we have the former hero of Metro City, and my main from SF4, Cody. Dude was locked up, but the prison world changed him OD. Now he's addicted to fighting, so much so that he breaks out of prison just to look for a good brawl. 
Anyway, next is the Mike Tyson wannabe Balrog. Originally from Street Fighter 2, he's a former heavyweight boxing champion who ended up working for Bison. As a member of Shadaloo, he was tasked with apprehending Gen and Birdie, the latter of which left Shadaloo with the goal of overthrowing Bison himself. <laughs> yeah, okay, Birdie. Good luck with that. Then there is Blanca, who also came from Street Fighter 2. This dude then joined the roster by accident. He was chilling in his home in the Amazon jungle until he accidentally entered human civilization on a poacher's truck. Also, two fun facts. His name is actually Jimmy, and during the Alpha series, he couldn't really communicate with humans. He was just out here screaming, grunting, and electrocuting people. Sticking with the Street Fighter 2 characters, next we have E Honda. He's a sumo wrestler from Japan, who's in the game to show the world the true power of sumo. That's it. Also, and I'm just now realizing this while recording, Homie's government name is Edmund Honda. Edmund Honda. Nothing wrong with the name, it's just that from what I know, he's from Japan, so I didn't think his first name would be Edmund. I even double checked his origins just to make sure, and yeah, he's 100% from Japan. Maybe that's why he wasn't fully Japanese in the live action Street Fighter movie. Who knows? Next up in the roster, we have Rainbow Mika, the pro wrestler who made her debut in Alpha 3. She just wants to make a name for herself by traveling the world and throwing hands in the street. She's also a huge fan of Zangief. Next is Karin Kanzuki, who made her debut in the manga Sakura Ganbaru. She's Sakura's rival and heir to the prestigious Kanzuki Zaibatsu. Outside of her rivalry with Sakura fueling her, she's also here to look into Shadaloo since they're interested in her family's business. And that's it for the main roster. In the arcade release, the home console port of Alpha 3 added a bunch of new characters. To start, we have another character from Street Fighter 2, Fei Long, our token Bruce Lee copy. Like many of the other fighters, he pulled up to the story looking for smoke, and in turn attracted the attention of Shadaloo. After the cycle drive was destroyed, a movie was released detailing the events, but with Fei Long as the main character. My man really used a whole crisis to shoot his way into stardom. Next, we have the kickboxing musician, DJ. I remember first hearing about DJ and getting so hyped not only because he was one of the first black characters in Street Fighter, but also because he's from my home country, Jamaica. But he's another charge character. So I tried him and failed terribly. Honestly, I gotta give it to the guys who play these kind of characters. How the hell do you charge while keeping up with someone trying to kill you? Like, I feel like when I fight a charge character, they're used so seamlessly that I don't even peep the charge. They just body the shit out of me. Don't cheat, it's fine. You're just ass at Street Fighter. Say it with your chest. Anyway, originating from Street Fighter 2, DJ started traveling the world after becoming a world champion kickboxer. On his travels, he was heard humming some dope tune by a music producer. And that tune inspired him to work on a whole album with our boy. So basically, homie was looking for smoke, but found his love for music. Next is another Street Fighter 2 character, T-Hawk from the Thunderfoot tribe. He entered the plot because people from his village disappeared and he suspects Shadaloo to be responsible. Julie, one of the dolls, actually used to be his girlfriend. Following him, we have Guile, also originating from Street Fighter 2. Now, Guile's place in the story is a little confusing because of continuity issues. He entered the plot to go looking for his comrade, Charlie, who went AWOL after his last mission. If you don't remember, he was killed after it was revealed that some of the US military is working with Shadaloo. But in his Alpha 3 story, Charlie is still alive, and he actually helps him in Chinley defeat Bison and destroy the Psycho Drive. However, because of Street Fighter V, we now know the Alpha 2 ending in which Charlie gets killed on a solo mission is a canon one. So technically, Guile just came here searching for his friend who we didn't know was dead. That's pretty depressing when you think about it. And the last two from the roster are Shinakuma and Evil Ryu. But Shinakuma is just Akuma when he goes full Satsui no Hado. And Evil Ryu is a what if character that shows what would happen if Ryu also went full Satsui no Hado. The only canon version of Evil Ryu is Kage, who doesn't pull up till Street Fighter V. Now, we can finally- Hold up, hold up. We're still missing a few people. Wait, what? Okay, did the arcade roster, did the console roster? Oh shit, I'm sorry y'all. I forgot there were two portable versions of Alpha 3, one for the Game Boy Advance and another for the PSP titled Street Fighter Alpha Max. The portable editions added Eagle, who was originally just a rando in Street Fighter 1, Maki from Final Fight 2, Yun from Street Fighter 3, and Ingrid from Capcom Fighting Jam. Eagle's looking to perfect his fighting style and ends up fighting Guile in the process. But this is where his story falls apart because he joins Guile in apprehending Shadaloo. But we now know that Guile's part in the Alpha 3 story can't be canon. So Eagle is just kinda here. Apparently he also sees Sagat as his rival, so there's that. Maki studies the Bushin Ryu style like Guy, and she joins the game to challenge him for the title of Grandmaster. Fun fact, like Karin, she also made her debut in Sakura Ganburu, and she's also a rival of Sakura's. The Kung Fu practitioner Yun appears because he hears that Fei Long is working with Shadaloo, but his entry also isn't canon. Don't worry though, him and his brother Yang appear later. And last we have Ingrid, who's looking for Shadaloo because she claims to be the original user of Psycho Power. Now, her entry isn't canon either because in her story she's the one who beat 
defeats Bison, but what she does is still pretty interesting. After Bison's defeat, it's revealed that her crest is powering the Psycho Drive. She then uses it to travel into the future to see what's become of Ryu. Who knows, maybe this means she'll make an appearance in Street Fighter 6. But with that, we are finally out of the Alpha series. Now onto Street Fighter 2, the part of the story that's most confusing, mainly because it's not really clear who does what, but I'll try my best to connect all the dots. The good thing here is that even though there were a lot of iterations of Street Fighter 2, like this shit digs back all the way to the original that released in 1991 and goes on till Ultra Street Fighter 2, which launched in 2017, the roster for the most part stayed the same. So a little less work for us, yay. But with that, time for some lore. This part of the plot is jump-started by Bison's evil ass. Dude somehow found another body after hiding in Rose for so long and avoided going to jail by bribing the judge. Now he's back on his quest to get Ryu. He really wants my man's body, fam. To lure him out, Bison forms a new base in Thailand and announces the second World Warrior tournament. Vega and Balrog enter because, well, they kind of have to. I mean, they're still a part of Shadowloo. Sagai enters looking for his rematch against Ryu, and even though he had all that character development, he's still a part of Shadowloo. You hate to see it. Blanca joins simply because the shit he went through in the Alpha series made him realize he loves street fighting. Also, he knows how to speak a little now thanks to becoming friends with Dan and Sakura. Kami joins because of her past ties to Bison. After the events of the Alpha series, she woke up with amnesia and was found by the British government organization Delta Red. Luckily, her combat skills stuck with her and she's been an asset for the team ever since. Since Bison killed her dad, Chun-Li enters looking for revenge and to end Shadowloo. DJ, now a major music artist, joins just to promote his work and find a new beat for his next album. I guess delivering hands inspires him to write music. Dalsim returns from India to once again raise money for his village, but he realizes fighting, even if it's for the betterment of his people, goes against his pacifist beliefs. So after the tournament, he quits fighting and travels the world to help people in need. E Honda makes his return to once again show the world the power of sumo. Also, apparently a bunch of his fellow sumo wrestlers were caught taking a really sketchy drug made by Shadaloo. So Honda's also trying to look into that. One of the reasons why he has his face paint on is so he can hide his identity. So homie's like a whole sumo vigilante. Moving on, Zangief also returns to show the world the power of his country. Fei Long enters after taking advantage of the Psycho Drive incident to make a movie. The tournament makes him realize that he's a much bigger fan of real smoke instead of the choreographed smoke he's used to on movie sets. Man said, enough of the fake shit. I want real danger. Guile joins to avenge Charlie, and T-Hawk joins to reclaim his people's land from Bison, and save his lover Julia, who goes by Julie now. Ryu enters to, of course, test his strength, and he convinces Ken to join after sending him a letter talking about how hard he's been training. It's crazy, because Ken almost didn't join since he found a new flame in his future wife, Eliza. At last, we have Akuma, who decides not to join, but instead watches what happens to see if anyone here is worthy of his hands. With that, the World Warrior Tournament commences, but like I said before, it's not clear what really happens. Ken and Ryu definitely meet up for a match, but the winner is never revealed. And to make things more confusing, Street Fighter 2 technically has two different endings, and I'm not sure what which one is canon? On one hand, we have the ending where Guile, Chun-Li, Kami, Ryu, and Ken team up to defeat Bison. After his loss, instead of giving himself up, he offs himself by exploding with Psycho Power. On the other hand, we have the ending where Akuma pulls up on Bison and hits him with a raging demon to kill him and fight whoever the finalist is. Personally, I like the second ending more because it just shows how much Akuma does not give a fuck. Man didn't even enter the tournament. He just skipped to the final boss and ended his ass because he could. This is why Akuma's the GOAT. But whichever ending you go with, the main thing to know is that Bison is dead. Again. Now before we move to Street Fighter 4, there were two other characters who were in Street Fighter 2. Evil Ryu and Violent Ken. They were in Ultra Street Fighter 2. We already know about Evil Ryu, but Violent Ken is completely new. He's the version of Ken that was controlled by Bison Psycho Power. One can argue that he's also a what-if character, but technically we already saw this Ken when Ryu had to fight him in the Alpha series. With that, we can move on to the next game in the timeline. Street Fighter 4. As usual, Bison somehow returns from the dead, but he's not the one who jumpstarts the plot this time. Or at least, not directly. Remember how Bison was doing research on possible body replacements for himself? One of those experiments, specifically the 15th, led to the creation of Seth, a literal martial arts machine. They were made by slapping together the fighting styles of multiple different World Warrior competitors. Homie was dead made by the smoke. And they are not a fan of Shadaloo. 
In fact, after Bison's supposed death, Seth was like, Fuck that dude! I'm a way better final boss than him! Then proceeded to take over the remains of Shadaloo through its weapon division, the Shadaloo Intimidation Network, aka Sin. CIA agent Crimson Viper makes her debut in this game and she joins Sin to figure out what they're planning. Jury, the Taekwondo menace that everyone fucks with, also joins Sin. But she has ulterior motives as well that we'll get into later. By Seth's command, she's set to take down and kidnap the rest of the dolls left back by Shadaloo. Her mission almost succeeds, but Kami pulls up and manages to save Junie, one of the dolls from the Alpha series. Once she returns to Seth, they pull up Bison and start another World Warrior tournament. Through something known as the Bleas Project, Sin has been working on a machine with the ability to augment one's key. To fully develop it, they need data on the strongest fighters in the world, hence the tournament. And of course, just like Bison, their main target is Ryu for that hefty Satsui no Hado. Ryu ends up joining the tournament to get a rematch with Ken. Instead, he ends up getting his rematch with Sagat, who is now done with Shadaloo. And though it's not confirmed, it seems like Ryu wins this time. Juri and T Viper join because of their loyalty to Sin. But the most important competitor is Bison, who enters just to fuck shit up. Homeboy psycho crushes his way through the tournament with a weaker body than usual, might I add, and beats the mess out of Seth. Then my man reveals this is all a part of his plan. Guessing he was too lazy to revive Shadaloo after Street Fighter 2, so we just had Seth do it for him. After Seth's loss, Juri shows up revealing this was all part of her plan too. See, when she was a kid, her father was a prosecutor who was going after Shadaloo, but Bison couldn't have that, so he killed her parents. The attack also severely damaged her eye. So 10 years later, she had an operation done by Sin to install the Feng Shui engine in her missing eye socket. This is a small device meant to boost her fighting power. Since then, she's been an assassin for Sin, with the main goal of getting Seth and Bison to kill each other. But her mission failed since Seth got bodied. When she finds what's left of Seth, she kills them by stomping out their tandem engine, the source of their energy. But now you're probably wondering, wait, if Jury kills Seth, then how the hell does Ryu fight them later? Well, apparently this is just one Seth. After Bison's attack, he freed all the copies of Seth that were made by Sin. So Ryu, and anyone else who fought Seth during the end of their story, actually fought a clone. Speaking of Ryu, once he makes it through the tournament and gets his Seth fight, he beats the guy and destroys the Bleas project. Afterwards, he leaves with Sakura, who once again entered this tournament looking for Ryu. Sometime later, Ryu is found by his old master, Goken, who actually wasn't killed by Akuma. Damn, Akuma's lacking. Nah, bro. Goken was straight up using hacks. So y'all know how the Raging Demon, or Shun Goku Satsu, attacks your soul? Well, Goken countered that by using the opposite of the Satsui no Hado, the power of nothingness, to straight up empty his soul. Homeboy Goken dead said, can't kill my soul if it's not there, brother. But now that he's back, he makes himself useful by sealing Ryu's Satsui no Hado with the power of nothingness. Wait, wait. You mean Goken could have helped Ryu out this whole time but instead chose to play dead? Pretty much. I guess it was Goken's idea of a lesson. Bro, fuck lessons. I have literal black Air Force energy tearing me apart every day. Help me, sensei. The fuck? Anyway, Akuma re-emerges afterwards pissed that Goken would dare mess with his pup. So the two duke it out once again to decide who gets to keep Ryu. We're not told who wins this, but since Ryu is not crazy evil in Street Fighter 3 or 5, we can assume that Goken managed to get the W. Later, Ryu reunites with Ken, and they chase after their master, angry that he's trying to dip again without saying a thing. But Goken's like, bruh, y'all are grown-ass men. Stop following me and live your damn lives. And that's pretty much it for the main story of Street Fighter 4. Now on to the characters we didn't get to. Let's start with the main roster from vanilla Street Fighter 4. First up is newcomer Abel. Before SF4, he was actually one of the first successful replacement bodies made for Bison, but it seems like he became self-aware like Kami, so he was deemed imperfect. And Shadaloo abandoned his ass because of it. Luckily, Charlie, back when he was alive, found him suffering from amnesia and saved his life. In Street Fighter 4, he decides to go on a journey to find out who he really is, and this journey brings him to professional Shadaloo hater Chun Li. She tells him entering the tournament made by Sin is his best bet to get some answers. On his journey of self discovery and smoke, he runs into Guile and confirms that this guy was friends with Charlie. Later, when she hits the fan at Sin HQ, Abel helps Guile and Chun Li escape the Shadaloo base, but on the way, he runs into a Seth clone and realizes how similar they look. This is because Seth and Abel are technically brothers. They were made using the same experiments, it's just that Seth was a better model. The devs were actually thinking of naming Seth Cain because of this to stick with the biblical reference. If you didn't already know, Cain and Abel were the first two sons of Adam and Eve. However, they chose to instead name him Seth after Seth Killian, the former senior manager of community at Capcom. This also preserved the biblical reference since Seth was the third son of Adam and Eve, meant to replace Abel after Cain killed him. Anyway, following this, he's met by Bison, who lets him go after calling him imperfect. Then after the fall of Sin, Abel decides to continue his journey of self-discovery. But what were Chun-Li and Guile doing here? Well, being two of the biggest Shadaloo haters in existence, they joined 
joined the new tournament solely to see what Sin was up to. Cammy, still working with Delta Red, joined the meta point. When she was going down at Sin HQ, she found a former doll named DiCapri suffering from Bison's mind control. To save her, she's forced to leave her with Bison, which is a very questionable move. Why would Bison save your friend when he's the one who made her like this? Regardless, Cammy continued her infiltration and found data on the Bleach project. Her mission was to collect this data, but out of fear that keeping it intact could do more harm than good, she deletes it instead. This pisses C Viper off, who only joined Sin to get a hold of this info. Nevertheless, after she leaves the base, she decides to continue her hunt for the rest of Bison's 26 engineered bodies. Moving on, our boy Blanca returns in his tournament because people were looking at him funny back at home. Now he wants to fight her in everyone's respect. But post his demise, he heads home after finding out his mom was looking for him this whole time. Yoga Master Dal Seam forgets about his pacifism pact to enter the tournament because Sin is messing with the water in his village. Shadowloo stays messing with my man Dal Seam, bro. Luckily, with the fall of Sin, Dal Seam gets his water back, but he's starting to get sick and tired of Shadowloo's bullshit. E Honda appears to once again show the world the power of Sumo. His quest for smoke brings him to another newcomer, El Fuerte. This joke character entered just to increase his culinary skills. He sparks some beef with Zangief to prove who was the better wrestling style. Also, fun fact, El Fuerte was trained by the master of El Stingray, a character from the very old Slam Master series developed by Capcom. Mike Haggard from Final Fight was also in this series, and it's said that Slam Masters is also within the Street Fighter universe. On to Zangief, he came back because apparently, younger kids from his country thought his wrestling was boring and would rather watch other martial artists. So he pulled up the tutorial tournament, beat his Seth clone, and took a picture of him holding the unconscious clone to prove to his younger fans that he's still the shit. Newcomer Rufus makes his debut solely because Ken is seen as the strongest fighter in the US, and he feels like the title belongs to him. They find the tournament, and though the winner is not made clear, I think we can all agree that Ken beat this dude's ass. Dan comes back to spread the word about his Saikyo Ryu style, and Fei Long returns from his movie career because Sin attacked his crew. The mysterious Rose also reemerges after seeing a vision of Bison's return. She's later met by the tyrant, who takes back the power that he left within her, which restores all the memories of what he did while in Rose's body. Bro, that must have been scary as shit. Imagine being flooded with memories of Bison doing wild shit in your body. I'll be shook! She ends up getting saved by a guy who doesn't fully appear until Super Street Fighter 4. The assassin, Gen, returns and joins the tournament looking to avenge Chun-Li's father's death. They used to be friends and because of that, he's been protecting Chun-Li when he could. Later, he catches Akuma's fight with Goken over Ryu, which inspires him to keep fighting even though his body is giving out on him. Next, we have Vega. After Shadaloo collapsed due to the events in Street Fighter 2, he went back to bullfighting but soon got bored of it. He was hired by Sin but betrayed them the moment Seth's plan started falling apart. Sounds about right. He ended up taking a copy of the Bleach Project's data before Kami destroyed it, and dips the running into Chun-Li. Fellow Shadowloo member Balrog isn't entered the tournament, but is instead sent by Bison to Sin HQ to retrieve one of Seth's bodies. But Balrog's trying to get paid, so instead of doing his job, he goes looking for treasure. His search brings him to a young boy with a glowing Shadowloo mark. Balrog doesn't know anything about the kid, but surmises that he might be valuable, so he takes him and dips. And that's it for the vanilla roster. Now for everyone added in Super Street Fighter 4. Starting with Adon, he hears about the New World Warrior Tournament and enters to fight his former master, Sagat. Before the tournament was even announced, Sagat pulled up to one of Adon's matches looking for inspiration. He eventually got challenged by Adon and whooped his ass. Now the former pupil is trying to end Sagat's life out of revenge. They cross paths in the tournament and unfortunately, Adon whoops Sagat's ass again. God damn it, Sagat, what happened to all that character development? Next up is my boy Cody and his boy Guy. Cody once again breaks out of jail due to boredom after hearing about the New World Warrior Tournament. Guy enters after Sin floods his home of Metro City with weapons. They eventually meet and throw hands, but like almost every fight in Street Fighter 4, we don't know who wins. What we do know is that after everything went down, Cody returned to a cell, and Guy saved Rose. But man, I remember when Cody's trailer dropped and I just knew he was gonna be my main. His theme song, the way my man just broke out of prison for the smoke, the fact that his punches are so real they summon mini tornadoes. Yo, Cody was that dude. Anyway, how Jamaican bro DJ makes his return because he's bored of music and wants to get back into fighting. British boxer Dudley from Street Fighter 3 pulls up two after getting invited to this new tournament. Another newcomer, Hakan, joins the tournament to show the world the power of the Turkish national sport, oil wrestling. And yes, this is a real thing and it's exactly what it sounds like. Wrestlers douse themselves in oil and go at it. It's a tradition that dates back 4,500 years. Well, all right. You learn something new every day. Back to Hakan, in his story it's revealed that he's old friends with E Honda. They just argue about whose martial art is better. Ibuki, who made her debut in Street Fighter 3 as well, sneaks out of her ninja school in Japan to enter the tournament just to meet cute boys. Makoto, another character from Street Fighter 3, joins for honestly the noblest of reasons. She practiced Rindo Khan karate in Japan, but her father died, leaving her to take care of the failing dojo. She made it to the end of the tournament, but she came a little too late. Seth already lost, so she didn't win any money. But even with that pulling her down, 
down. She returns to Japan ready to make money the old fashioned way. Yo, Makoto is best girl, bro. You heard her here first. And last in the Super Street Fighter 4 set, we have T Hawk, who entered the tournament for atonement for failing all those pastimes against Shadowloon. Damn, dude still didn't find his girlfriend? Well, he did in his ending, but that doesn't seem to be canon since she's still a doll in Street Fighter 5. Now, onto the added characters from Street Fighter 4 Arcade Edition. The only important people from this expansion were the Kung Fu twins Yun and Yang. They appeared because they followed Chun Li, thinking whoever she fights must be a worthy opponent. Evil Ryu got added, but once again, he's a what if character. And Oni got added, but he's a what if version of Akuma that went 100% into the Satsui no Hado. Think Shin Akuma, but on crack. Next up are the characters from the final iteration of Street Fighter 4, Ultra Street Fighter 4. First, we have Elena from Street Fighter 3. She's a princess from Kenya who practices the dope ass art of dancing smoke, capoeira. Her dream is to travel the world and meet new friends, but after she hears a disturbance in the forces of nature, she's tasked with joining Synth Tournament to discover what the source of that disturbance is. She doesn't end up finding it, but she does form friendships with a bunch of the Street Fighter cast, including Akuma, who she took a picture with. Homegirl has to be on a different level if she got the Lord of Black Air Force energy to be her friend. Next are Hugo and Poison. These guys also made their debut in Final Fight, and they were a part of the same Mad Gear gang Rolento and Sodom were a part of. However, after the fall of the gang, they separated. Years later in Street Fighter 4, wrestler Hugo decided to join the Sin tournament to show off his strength, while wrestling manager Poison joined looking for new talent. By the end of the tournament, Hugo allows Poison to become his manager. Sticking with the Final Fight graduates, Rolento returns because he hears about the Bleeze project. With the goal of using it for his new army, he joins the tournament, but the project was destroyed before he could get to it. And last in the roster is the Capri, who we already went over. She was taken in by Sin after Shadowloo's fall, with her objective being to kill Seth. However, as you know, Kami found her later and gave her right back to Bison because he's the only one that can save her deteriorating mind. And that is it for what happened in Street Fighter 4. Now we move on to Street Fighter 5. So, since Bison returned to Street Fighter 4, Shadow was back on its bullshit. However, they have a new member named Fang who replaced Sagat. Fang is the one to jumpstart the plot this time with his plan, Operation Chains. He sends a bunch of giant satellites named Black Moons up in space, and plans on using them to cause a giant EMP across the world. They plan on using the chaos that will ensue to boost Bison psycho power. But thankfully, one of the hackers they kidnapped to make this all happen sabotaged the plan by sending the keys for each Black Moon to a different warrior in the Street Fighter universe. Newcomer Rashid received one of these pieces because the hacker who sabotaged Operation Chains was his close friend. He raised the Shadowloo base with the goal of saving them, but unbeknownst to him, Fang killed them. To make shit worse, Fang finds him during the infiltration, proceeds to whoop his ass, then steals his key. With it, he detonates one of the Black Moons, sending an EMP through New York and throwing the place into chaos. Yo, Rashid, you really dropped the ball, my guy. All this gets the good guys to start making moves. Karen Kanzuki recruits Ibuki and Birdie to look into these Black Moons. Meanwhile, a mysterious group led by a woman who goes by Helen revives Charlie and sends them to collect the keys to the moons. And you already know our professional Shadowloo haters are pulling up too. Guile and Chun-Li team up again and beeline it to New York. But what about our boy Ryu? Well, even though Goken sealed the Satsui no Hado, it's still fucking with him. So he's currently trying to figure out how to get a handle on this. He goes to Dalsim for guidance, who tells him that he must face the murderous intent instead of trying to suppress it. However, his lecture is cut short by the ancient Aztec warrior, Nakali, AKA Demon Jesus. This guy seeks the souls of powerful fighters to eat them. His target is now Ryu. In good old Street Fighter fashion, they duke it out, but Nakali overpowers him and forces him to tap into the Satsui no Hado. Fortunately, Dalsim saves our boy, but Nakali dips afterwards. Back in New York, Chun-Li and Guile find Bison, Fang, Vega, and Balrog causing mischief. Chun-Li tries to square up with Bison even though this is a losing battle and proceeds to get her shit rocked. Bison almost ends her ass too, but the homie Kami shows up just in time to save them. They escape and it's revealed that Guile and Chun-Li both have Black Moon keys, but they can't do anything about that now because Charlie appears looking for those same keys. And even though Guile used to be his bro, he doesn't recognize him, so he beats the squad, takes their keys, and dips. He returns to Helen's hideout where he meets Rashid and Juri, who were just recruited. I should also mention that Juri has an eye patch because before all this, she tried fighting Bison and Homeboy ripped out her feng shui engine eye. She eventually found another, but Jesus, Juri, you're tough shit. Anyway, at Helen's base, she tells the rest of them the same thing she told Charlie about the keys. They need to collect them and stop Shadaloo. But during her explanation, her boss Yurian shows up. Now this guy isn't important right now, but just know that he can't be trusted. And to prove that, the first thing he does when he shows up is beat the mess out of Charlie. 
Luckily, the rest of the squad stops his crazy ass before it gets too serious. Elsewhere, Karin starts making moves to stop Operation Chains as well, by recruiting a bunch more fighters from the Street Fighter world. When Ryu and Ken are contacted after a sparring match, Ken says he'll go for the both of them. Right now, Ryu needs to focus on keeping that Satsui no Hado in check. Back at Kanzaki HQ, the recruited fighters start making plans to split up and search for the fighters with chess pieces. Ken heads to Brazil where he meets the bro, Sean Matsuda from Street Fighter 3, and his sister, Laura Matsuda, my main for the short time that I played Street Fighter 5. Laura has one of the keys, but since this is Street Fighter, she doesn't give it up without a fight. And in a wild turn of events, she beats Ken. Well, shit, even in the lore, Laura's no joke. After the brawl, Sean convinces his sister that these guys ain't here for the smoke. They need her key. So Laura gives him the key and joins the squad with the goal of making Matsuda Jiu-Jitsu known around the globe. Meanwhile, Gao joins grappler God Zangief to look for another key. But they run into Balrog and the kitty saved in Street Fighter 4 named Ed. They manage to fend off the duo at first, but then Ed uses his psycho power to snatch the key they were looking for. Back in New York, we find another character from Street Fighter 3, Alex. This dude is actually from New York completely forgot about that. His parents died when he was young and ever since then, he's lived with his dad's friend, Tom, and Tom's daughter, Patricia. While raising him, Tom taught Alex the art of the hands. Dalsim confronts him asking about the key he received. Then after fighting for no reason, Alex just hands it to him. Alex is just hungry for the smoke, bro. Back in Brazil, DiCapri pulls up to Ken, Laura, and the gang. If you don't remember, last time we saw her, Bison took her in because her mind was falling apart. Cammy jumps in and knocks her out, but the cops pull up at the worst time because Sean called them. Sean, you have superhuman martial artists by your side. There was no need for the cops. They tried to arrest her, but Cammy can't have that because this is her sis. So she assaults one of the cops, then Jury pulls up dead ass out of nowhere and takes out the other one. Afraid that she might get her friends caught up in some bullshit, she decides to take the Capri and leave with Jury. Not sure why Jury even came for her, but whatever. Later, Team Kanzaki regroups and infiltrates the Shadow Lou HQ holding the machine that powers Operation Chains. There they find Rashid, and since they're after the same thing, Rashid forgets about his squad and joins theirs. Damn, homie wasn't loyal at all. Honestly, after talking to Helen and Yurian, I would have left too. With Rashid, they managed to nab the rest of the keys. So they steamroll their way through the machine, run into Abel, who's been undercover as a Shadow soldier this whole time, and together they shut down the moons. But Fang's bitch ass is like, welp can't have that, and instructs one of the hackers to program all the moons to collapse in 24 hours. I mean, I guess this will give Bison more than enough chaos to mess with. Yeah, at the cost of millions of lives. Yo, Bison truly does not give a fuck. Speaking of Bison, homie pulls up to the base because he's sick of people messing with his plans. And Charlie comes through just in time, ready for the smoke. He's been waiting for this shit, bro. But sadly, he gets his ass beat again. You hate to see it. Before Bison kills him, Nikali returns because this is where all the violence is happening. And if you don't remember, this guy feasts on the smoke. Bison hits us with a all according to plan because he's freaking Bison and he and Nikali fight while Charlie runs for his life. This time Nikali gets his ass beat and dips. Later, Rashid finds a weakened Charlie and they book it together when Nikali reappears for the smoke. They unite with Team Kanzaki as they escape the base on a helicopter. Elsewhere with Kami and Jury because they're a team now, DiCaprio starts walling out again trying to kill Kami. Then Vega pulls up just to throw hands. The lore reason for this is because he sees a new form of beauty in her and he wants to see it more. So honestly, yeah, he just came to throw hands. He beats Kami, loses to Jury, then leaves after seeing Kami defend her sis. Back at Kanzaki HQ, Charlie and Rashid return to their people to figure out what they can do about these falling satellites. There, Helen reveals a clue that was left back by Rashid's friend for him. Now Rashid knows how to stop the moons. Dope. Oh, also, I should mention that Kami is with Team Helen now. Guess she's just following Jury for the time being. Helen starts going on about how this is for sure gonna take down Shadaloo, and now she's all excited and shit. Then she turns to Charlie saying, now you can finally kill Bison. Aren't you hype? But Charlie's not down for it. He's like, I'm gonna be real with you, lady. I tried fighting Bison and I got my ass beat. She was terrible, bro. Not doing that again. Then Helen actually gets tight saying, bro, what the fuck? You saying I revived you for no reason? The whole point of you being here was to beat Bison and you can't even do that? Yo, this is why you're gonna die again soon. And Charlie's like, yeah, bitch, I know. But now I'm leaving your ass because you're disrespectful as shit. 
They need dips and Rasheed leaves with them. Damn, Helen done fucked up and lost two people. Serves her crazy ass right. Back at Kanzuki HQ, Ryu finally returns to the plot now that his training is done. And I'm sure the whole satellite falling thing got him on his shit. Nikali meets him for the smoke and Ryu kicks his ass with his new ability, the power of nothingness. The same thing Goken used to tank the raging demon. Now that Ryu's here, Team Kanzuki sets out to jump Bison again. Charlie and Rashid come through too, but they're basically their own squad now. Once Team Kanzuki lands at the base, they fight through some dolls while Kami, Jiri, and a seemingly okay DiCapri join to do the same. Eventually, Rashid stops Operation Falling Chains, which in turn frees the dolls from their mind control. Charlie confronts Bison again, even though he knows he's about to get bodied, but this time he sacrifices himself Majin Fujita style to deplete Bison's power. Man took L's for his whole story, but at least he went out a hero. Next up on the chopping block is annoying ass Fang. Can I just say, this dude was the worst addition to Shadowloo. Pretty sure he only got this job because he's a professional no bison dick rider. Fortunately, Chun Li whoops his ass and saves the last hacker, a little girl named Lee Fen. Now it's time for Ryu to claim the W for the whole squad, even though he was MIA for pretty much the entire story. Using that good old power of nothingness, he defeats Bison once again. Maybe he'll actually stay dead this time. With that, they leave the base before it collapses, and they all live happily ever after. But wait! What about Helen? Is what you're probably thinking. Well, in a scene that plays in the credits, it's revealed that her name is actually Colleen. And this whole time, she's been secretly following Gil, the antagonist of Street Fighter 3. Now I can explain the secondary plot that was happening in the background. See, Gil, Orion, and Colleen are all involved with this cult known as the Secret Society, or the Illuminati. Throughout the lore, they've been manipulating things in the background. Their ultimate goal is to form their own utopia after the prophesized end of the world. Gil is seen as their destined leader because of his aptitude for the smoke. Colleen is the secretary, and Urian, his brother, is vice president. Colleen was trying to take out Shadaloo because there ain't enough room for two big ass evil organizations in this plot. And that perfectly sets us up for the Street Fighter 3 story. But before that, let's talk about the characters we missed. First up is Abigail, someone I thought was a newcomer, but he actually originates from Final Fight. He used to be a part of the Mad Gear gang. However, in Street Fighter V, he renounced his life of crime and now runs a mechanic garage in Metro City. In his story, he fights people because he likes making car noises, but people mistake it for farting and other weird noises. Also, crazy fact, this dude is 8 feet tall and 584 pounds. Jesus! Next is the master of smoke, Akuma. After his fight with Goken to claim Ryu, he continued his journey to find the ultimate opponent. Before the whole Operation Chains incident, he ran to Gen and seemingly killed him after a fight. Later, he finds Ryu and tests out his power of nothingness in battle. Akuma wins, but Ryu takes the L with stride, saying his fist will continue to communicate with Akuma from the opposite side of the smoke. With that, Akuma leaves again. Next up is Ed, who was present during the SF5 story, but there are still things you guys should know about him, especially since I think he's going to be very important to the future of Street Fighter. After Balrog saved him from the Shadaloo base, he trained him in the art of boxing. I'm guessing due to Shadaloo's experiments, he ended up growing into a teenager rather quickly. However, he's constantly haunted by nightmares. After the fall of Shadaloo, he feels Bison trying to creep back into his mind, but he breaks out of the trance. However, he fears that he's a threat to his guardian, Balrog. If he can't keep his psycho power in check, he could kill the guy. But Balrog's like, what? Hurt me? Child, I'm basically your father. You ain't hurting shit. Feeling insulted, Ed challenges him and wins. So he leaves and months later, he forms a new organization dubbed Neo Shadaloo. Their goal is to find others who were experimented on by Shadaloo and give them a home. Damn, Ed. That's noble as fuck. Sticking with the newcomers, next we have Manat, the Egyptian fortune teller and apprentice of Rose. Before Operation Change, she confronted Ed and warned him about hard times coming up for him and his boy Balrog. This is most likely referencing how they split up after Shadaloo's fall. Following Manat is Zeku. He's technically a newcomer, but his official first appearance was as a Street Fighter Alpha 2, as an NPC. Y'all remember Guy? Well, this dude was his master. He was originally the Grand Master of Bushin Ryu Ninjutsu, but he passed that title on to Guy. Afterwards, he started working on his own fighting style meant to be an evolution of Bushin Ryu. Ryu. Before Shadaloo's fall, he tried recruiting new students, but to no avail. Later, he's seen contemplating a name for his new style. Strider ends up being one of the names he considers. Now, nothing has been confirmed yet, but I'm pretty sure this is a reference to the action platformer Strider. In that series, Striders are an elite league of high-tech ninjas. This could mean that the Strider series takes place in the future of the Street Fighter universe, and the Bushin Ryu style may be the roots of the Strider style. This is just a theory, though. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Back to the roster, next is our Brazilian homie, Blanca. Once again, he's not really doing anything important here. He started a business selling Blanca dolls and they end up becoming really popular in an arcade that Sakura works at. Speaking of Sakura, she's now grown and working a part-time job. The reason why she wasn't in the main plot was because she was busy adulting. Well, shit. 
chasing the bag instead of chasing the hands. I'm proud of you, girl. And in her story, she low-key has an early life crisis thinking about whether fighting is what she wants to do for the rest of her life. After Shadow Lose falls, she runs into Ryu, and once they fight, she realizes that one day she wants to start a family. Homegirl is really growing up. Cody returns to SF5-2 as the mayor of Metro City. Former mayor Mike Hager exonerated him of his crimes and gave him the title. Now he's running the city and cleaning up its streets. Dude went from jailbird to mayor. Illest promotion ever. Next is Fock, another newcomer to the series. She once was a Shadaloo experiment until Ed found her and saved her. He later recruits her into Neo Shadaloo. Following her is a mysterious Abraham lookalike and newcomer, G. Apparently this guy calls himself the president of the world. That's a cocky ass title. G's dream is to unify the world, and he does this by raising his popularity through social media. But one of the biggest mysteries about G is in regards to Q, another ominous character who debuted in Third Strike. Since G dropped, everyone has been talking about how similar these two are. And what makes it even more odd is that we're not given much about either of them. To be honest, I'm not really sure if G and Q are the same person, mainly because Q doesn't even talk while G is super social. However, some proof lies in Gil's character story, which for the record takes place after Street Fighter 3, but for the sake of this explanation, I'm going to talk about it now. In his story, he deadass raids G's live stream to present himself to the world. They battle and Gil wins. Then G alludes to the fact that they are after the same thing. The mere fact that he has a connection with the boss of Street Fighter 3 is a big tell, but this could all just be Capcom throwing a huge red herring. Let me know what you guys think about G in the comments below. Anyway, on to our boy with all the L's, Sagat. Sagat's story in Street Fighter V was actually pretty interesting since it basically mirrors what Ryu went through. He's seen training, as he usually does, but the Satsui no Hado comes at him like a truck. Honestly, I didn't even know Sagat could tap into this shit. However, experiencing the murderous intent builds his understanding for Ryu. This helps him tap into the power of nothingness to quell the Satsui no Hado. Later, he's met by Kage, the embodiment of Ryu Satsui no Hado. Kage beats him, but Sagat comments on how this being will never be as strong as his boy Ryu. After that fight, Kage goes looking for the smoke against Akuma, but even after beating him, Akuma berates him and forces him to retreat. Afterwards, he returns to Ryu for more hands, but Ryu overcomes his influence by using the power of nothingness, so I guess Kage is dead now? E Honda returns to the game as well, but he's just traveling with Hakan and running his bathhouse. Man does not have a care in the world, even though Shadaloo was just trying to take over the world. Next, we have Lucia from Final Fight. She's a detective of the Metro City Police Department. She doesn't do much aside of attack Abigail because she thought he was still hanging with the Mad Gear gang. Later, Cody recruits her as well as Poison to take care of crimes going on in Metro City. Speaking of Poison, she's in this game too, but without Hugo since they fell out. It's all good though, cause her story ends with her giving the wrestler another shot. She also tried getting Abigail to be her wrestler of choice, but he's too busy being a mechanic to care about that shit. Seth also returns in SF5, or at least a copy of Seth. Jury was tasked with activating one of the dolls, but doing so caused Seth's personality to take over the doll. However, the transfer wasn't perfect, so Seth's mind is extremely unstable. They go looking for Bison for revenge, but they end up fighting Ed and Falk instead, thinking that these guys are Bison. After the brawl, Ed and Falk leave Seth B. They don't have time to worry about this thing switching up on them at a moment's notice. Next in the roster is Akira, the first playable Street Fighter character who originated from the old Capcom fighting game Rival Schools. Akira and her brother Daigo were orphans, but after the disappearance of Daigo, Akira made it her mission to find him. She she ended up fighting him in the second rival schools game, Project Justice, but we don't have time to talk about that right now. She entered the Street Fighter V story because she was looking for her old friend Sakura to train with. Yeah, if you don't know, Sakura made a cameo at Rival Schools. She visits the Kansaki estate, but she gets jumped because nobody knows who she is. Then they have a beach party when Sakura clears everything up. Next is the clown of the roster, Dan fucking Habigi. His dojo is failing, cause he's trash, so after being inspired by Blanca's dolls, he starts producing his own to advertise his fighting style. And that's pretty much all he's here for. Eleven is another newcomer to the series, but it doesn't do much here either. It's an experiment made by the Illuminati meant to copy the abilities of fighters. Before the events of the main story, Urien tried testing it out, but he deemed it as a failure, so Colleen used his body to bring back Charlie. This is why Urien came at him all crazy back in the story. He feels partially responsible for his creation. Moving on to Oro from Street Fighter 3. This guy's whole thing is that he's a legendary martial artist who mastered the art of Senjutsu. His goal is to find someone worthy enough to teach his techniques to. In Street Fighter 5, he goes on a quest to find that successor. He meets a lot of people, but the most important is Dalsim. They chat about multiple philosophies, and Oro mentions how he believes that forces like the Satsui no Hado and Psycho Power are not inherently evil. Bro. The Satsui no Hado is deadass a surge of murderous intent. That shit is evil as fuck. Don't try to sugarcoat it. 
Rose also returns to the plot, but this time she's less worried about Bison and more worried about this vision of the future she keeps having. It shows the end of the world, and for some reason the mysterious G is involved. Maybe this also has to do with the Illuminati's prophecy. With no idea on how to stop it, she thinks of finding a way to contact her past self. Maybe she'll be able to rewrite time that way. And last on the roster is a newcomer with big ass forearms, Luke. This guy's father sacrificed himself to stop a bomb that threatened to kill multiple people, thus inspiring Luke to join the army. But midway into his tenure, he realized this life may not be for him. Guile finds the kid and gives him some words of encouragement, leaving Luke more motivated to live a life that both he and his father can be proud of. And that just about covers everyone from Street Fighter V. But before we continue, I just want to thank all of you who are watching for making it this far. This is a project that has been months in the making, and it reminded me how much I truly love writing about video game lore. It was hard to get everything organized, but I am super proud of myself for getting it done. So once again, thank you from- All right, all right, they get it. Now can we please continue? We're almost done and I'm tired. Fine, jeez. Okay, y'all, we're at the final stretch. Let's talk about what happened in Street Fighter III Second Impact. For those who don't know, Street Fighter 3, New Generation came first, but Second Impact retcons a lot of the story, and Third Strike wraps up the events of Second Impact. It's been a few years since all that shit happened in Street Fighter 5. A lot of the original roster is older and done with fighting. The Illuminati is thriving right now though. Business is going well and the organization is growing, so much so that Gil ends up getting his hands on a fly new car that was previously owned by the father of Dudley. If you don't remember Dudley, he's the heavyweight British boxer who showed up in Super Street Fighter 4. Later, Gil challenges Alex's character taker Tom and beats him within an inch of his life. Homie said, call me the messiah of smoke. Meanwhile, under Gil's command, the Illuminati starts working on something deemed the G Project. It involves multiple genetic experiments with the goal of creating a league of super soldiers to populate the world when, according to their prophecy, Armageddon happens. Newcomers Necro and Twelve were created from these experiments. However, Necro went rogue because fuck the Illuminati. Later, as part of the same project, Gil and Colleen set up another world warrior tournament. They're looking for the strongest people who are worthy of surviving the upcoming apocalypse. And like the last Street Fighters, this should jumps our supply to the Street Fighter 3 games. Our boy Dudley enters to get his father's car back. He doesn't win, but Gil just gives it back to him. Bro. What was the point of taking it in the first place? Our girl Elena returns, not to enter the tournament, but to make some new friends. She ends up studying abroad in Japan. Ibuki Naruto runs back into the plot because her clan tasked her with finding the files from the G Project. Gil ends up just giving it to her though. The project is already underway, so no reason to keep this shit secret. The rogue experiment Necro, as well as his girlfriend Effie, enter the tournament for vengeful reasons, but Necro gets trapped in the process. He's later saved by his girlfriend, and they decide to just stay on the run so the Illuminati doesn't catch them. Oro enters looking for a worthy pupil, and also because the Illuminati is sus. Ryu enters for pretty much the same reason he's always been entering, for training. Ken enters too because father had just taken him away from his best bro for a while so he's looking to catch up. The boy Sean steps up from being a side character because he was inspired by Ken. Unfortunately, he's trash though. Like, I really hate to say it, but Sean is quite possibly the weakest playable character in the lore. After Street Fighter V, he spent his time hounding Ken to get the guy to teach him the hands. Multiple failed attempts led to Ken finally taking him on as a pupil. But after training him for a sec, homie sent him to fight Ryu out of annoyance. Damn, Ken, I understand you're just trying to raise your kid, but that's foul. Of course, Ryu whoops at ass, thus pushing Sean to train by himself. Yun and Yang return just to show off. Also, did you know Yun is the older twin brother? I don't know, from their designs, it just felt like Yang was the oldest, but hey, the more you know. Gil's hating ass brother Yuri enjoys the goal of defeating him and taking his place as leader of the Illuminati. But in the most hilarious turn of events, Gil lets his brother win, so Yuri gets the title of president, but he ends up getting promoted to Emperor of the Illuminati. So Yurian is still just player two. Damn. Homie Def needs some therapy. Anyway, Hugo returns with his partner Poison just for this mug. That's pretty much it. Akuma doesn't enter this tournament either, but like in the last tournament, he just lurks looking for someone to fight. He ends up fighting Gil and hitting him with the Raging Demon, but unbeknownst to Akuma, the guy revives himself afterwards. And last but not least, we have our new protagonist, Alex, who joins to avenge his master Tom. He ends up getting to the end and defeating Gil, but he passes on killing him and heads back home to see his boy Tom fully recovered. Also, fun fact, before this tournament, Alex entered another tournament where he fought against Balrog and destroyed him. So that feat and his win against Gil proves that Alex is one of the strongest characters in the Street Fighter canon. Gil even takes interest in him after their battle. But with that, let's get into Third Strike. 
and wrap up the Street Fighter 3 story. Since the tournament is over, not much happens here. Dudley gets knighted, Elena goes back into street fighting to make more friends, then decides to study abroad in France, Hugo and Poison start a new wrestling promotion, Ibuki challenges Oro for her ninja graduation exam, then has to college after passing, Sean enters a US martial arts tournament but takes another L, and Ken avenges him by winning the next tournament. Ryu later finds Ken and challenges his old friend to a sparring match, which he wins, then runs into Alex and beats him too. He encourages a young warrior to continue his training then goes back to his training. While on the run, Necro and his girl are confronted by Illuminati Experiment 12, but Necro beats the thing and they escape. Akuma and Oro meet up to duke it out, but we're never told who wins this match. Makoto hops back into the plot and challenges Ryu to a fight, which brings a shit ton of publicity to our dojo. Newcomer Remy joins the plot to honestly do nothing. He holds a grudge against fighting because his father left his family to pursue martial arts and his sister died in his absence, so he upholds his grudge by fighting. Well, that's fucking stupid. Yeah, I know. His story ends with him growing out of his grudge and moving on with his life. Also, he has moves similar to Guile and Charlie, so maybe he's related to one of them in some sense. Weird ass Q doesn't do much either. He's being investigated because of multiple murders that have to do with him, but his pursuers don't really get much on him. Which further solidifies why I don't think G and Q are the same person. I mean, G is crazy, but he wants to run the world, not kill people. But then again, there's a the possibility that Q is innocent, or maybe Q is G being mind controlled. Don't she? You're doing it again. You're right. You're right. Let me stop. Anyway, next is Yurian's bitch ass, who tries to kidnap Lee Fen for the G Project. Luckily, Chen Li hops back into the plot to save her. So Yurian's just taking L's as usual. Yup, but it continues. After Gil raided G's livestream in that cutscene in SF5 that actually takes place at their SF3, Yurian gets pissed. How dare his brother present himself to the world? So the dumbass hater challenges him once again to lose. Again! Yurian, just stop, bro. And the really sad part is that as Gil leaves, he's like, brother, your time to be my replacement will come to pass. That's what the prophecy states. Then Yurian's like, yo, fuck the prophecy. I want to be the chosen one. And he just continues to yell like this as Gil walks away. Dude has no respect for this man. None at all, bro. But with that, we have finally completed the Street Fighter timeline. Everything from Street Fighter 1 to now. We fucking did it, Conscience. Thank God. Now, after all that, the big question is, what does this all mean for Street Fighter 6? Well, as of the day that this is being recorded, we know that Blanca, Kami, Chun-Li, DJ, Dalsim, E. Honda, Guile, Jury, Ken, Luke, Ryu, and Zangief are returning to the roster. And Jamie, Kimberly, Manon, Marissa, Lily, and JP are making their debut to the series. As for what everyone's doing here, from what we know, Blanca has become a tour guide, Chun-Li is now done with hunting Shadow and she's now training Lee Fen, the same girl she saved in Street Fighter 5, meaning we could see Lee Fen as a playable character, Dalsim is still on his pacifist route, and E Honda is still trying to show the world how powerful Sumo is. Jamie, inspired by OG's Yun and Yang, is doing what he can to protect his hometown. By the way, for anyone wondering, Jamie is for sure going to be my main. Homie's fighting style is breakdancing kung fu, need I say more? Jury's just kinda chillin' now because she doesn't really have a reason to do anything since Bison's dead. Ken is apparently on the run because of criminal accusations, which we'll get into later. Kimberly graduated from college early and decided to train under Guy in the Bushin Ryu style because she was bored. So we have this black female character who's not only a ninja, but apparently she's a genius? Let's fucking go. Also, though I'm pretty sure I'm gonna be using Jamie as my main, I'm gonna be playing a lot of Kimberly too. Luke, who's now a contractor for a private military company, is spending his time teaching mixed martial arts. And of course, our old protagonist Ryu is back to seek true strength. As for everyone else that I didn't mention, we don't really have enough information about them yet. From this influx of new characters, as well as the huge influence hip hop culture has in the aesthetic of the game, I think Capcom is trying to make this a better version of Street Fighter 3. If you didn't already know, SF3's big thing was that it was going to bring players to a whole new generation of Street Fighter. The vanilla version had a bunch of new characters while just bringing back Ryu and Ken. However, at the time of release, a lot of people were pissed about how pretty much the whole roster was new. That's why more familiar faces joined with the release of Second Impact and Third Strike. I think now they're using what they learned from that and Street Fighter V to reopen the door to the new generation. And I think this attempt is way smarter because we have some new characters coming in and we're still getting the older characters, but with some more spice since they're actually aged this time. Like look at my boy Ryu finally out of his struggle gi. My man's got the drip now. 
Also, it's looking like we'll be getting a lot of callbacks to older Capcom franchises like Final Fight, since the game takes place in Metro City. During the trailers, we even see some guys from the Mad Gear gang. Maybe this means they'll be important to the plot. Who knows? Anyway, back to the whole new generation thing. I think what makes Street Fighter VI truly special is that you become a part of this new generation. In the new world tour mode, you get to create your own character and travel around Metro City to learn the true meaning of strength. So you're basically on the Ryu path. Pretty much. You explore the area learning from different masters to up your move list. So you get a first hand look of what it feels like to be a new fighter in the Street Fighter verse. It's not confirmed whether you can play online with your created character, but as a standalone feature, this is already pretty sick. I can very much see them making you the center of the story as shit unfolds. Which brings me to what I think is gonna happen in this game. I have two big theories. For the first one, I think the Illuminati is going to return because of their whole end of the world prophecy. Originally, I was sure that Bison would make his comeback, but now that I've had time to think on it, I truly think the Shadow Loose saga is over. Hell, the name for the SF5 story is A Shadow Falls. If that isn't a euphemism for the death of Bison, then I don't know what is. It would also be pretty repetitive because what's Bison gonna do this time? Hold another tournament to try and get a strong body? Bro, you've been doing that for years. Stop. Street Fighter V also worked as a smooth transition for the Illuminati to become the main villain of the series. And though SF3 did give us more on their story, I wouldn't say they completed it. We still have no idea what the Gate of Harmony is that G and Gil speak of, and this prophecy they keep bringing up is talking about the end of the world. That seems like something you would want to address directly, and it makes for a solid fighting game story. Maybe Yurian gets so sick of Gil that he starts another world warrior tournament in order to find someone strong enough to kill his brother and break the prophecy. But that ironically causes the Armageddon that you have to stop. And maybe this brings Ed's Neo Shadowloo to light. What if he and his squad start a war with Yurian because of his twisted goal? This part may be a reach because no one that we know from Neo Shadowloo has been confirmed, but it doesn't mean they won't be in the story. As for my second theory, if the main villain isn't the Illuminati, I think the Mad Gear gang will make a return. The fact that World Tour mode takes place in Metro City gives me a big feeling that they're gonna use it for the plot. Plus, we've seen multiple people from the Mad Gear gang show up in the SF canon before this. And though there are people that are done with it, there are still folks like Sodom who care about it and want to revive it. This could also link it to Ken's story because I'm pretty sure whatever criminal accusations he's facing, he was most likely framed for them. I truly don't think Ken has it in him to commit a crime. So what if the Mad Gears are somehow responsible for this? However, writing that out just made me realize how Ken's bio can fit into my previous theory. Shit, it might even make more sense this way. So we know that the Illuminati, or at the very least Urian, is making beings like 12 who can shape it into different fighters. What if the Illuminati use one of these experiments to frame Ken? Now Ken is out here trying to prove his innocence by pursuing the Illuminati. But which one do you guys believe more? Let me know in the comments. But fam, that is it for this Honest Gaming History. I really hope you enjoyed the Street Fighter deep dive. Leave a like if you did. Comment what else you'd like to see me cover in this series. And hit that bell to stay notified. Huge shout out to my lovely patrons. Your monthly donations allow me to continue making content like this. So truly, thank you guys so much for doing what you do. And with all that being said, be easy, stay lit, stay healthy out there. Black Lives Matter. And don't forget, you can do whatever the hell you put your mind to. All it takes is practice and time. Peace out, y'all.